But yeah, we're going to talk about ultimate blueprint for success today. It's great. I love helping people achieve results in their life. And a lot of the things that are holding our back are number one is your mindset. Uh, when you, if you don't control your mindset, you probably won't control much else in your life. So we really want to make sure that we're doing that. Let me make sure my slides are working and we'll move forward. Um, just because you're here today, what I want you to do is I want to give everybody a free gift because uh, number one, you need to recognize one thing in life and that is time is your only limited asset. Write that down. Time is my only limited asset. So when you that doesn't mean you don't choose to blow up a day here and there or have, go have fun. It just means recognize you can never have it back. You can never have it back. So uh, I just I appreciate you being here. So you're giving me an hour or 45 minutes of your time. So here's a here's a, a gift for you. You just text purpose to that number and and uh, you'll have a gift in your hands from that. Everybody get that clear? So that's just one of the many gifts. And I'm here to share with you, like I said earlier, the most critical element for achieving success in your life. How many are here to understand that? Would that be important to you? Does that make a difference for you? It's a decision we make in our lives. Are we ready to have that kind of success? So let's jump in and get started. The first test is kind of like um, looking at ourselves and saying, who are the people that we connect with right now in our life? So I would ask you again on that same piece of paper, take out and list down on your piece of paper, the five people you spend the most time with. And that doesn't include your spouse or your kids or your mother-in-law or father-in-law or ex-spouse, right? You're following me? This isn't about family members. It's about who are the five people you spend the most time with in your life. Just write those down on a piece of paper. And why is that important? Because we know Jim Rohn at one time, he told us all that we will become the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So when you start looking at that piece of paper and the five people you've written down, how many of you can raise your hand and go, you know what, Mary Jo, I need to choose better. I need to be more selective about who I spend time with. And I'm not asking you to disband with your friendships with people because we all have friends, we all have relatives, we all have time that we want to spend with people we love. But the idea of if you want to be successful in your life, you can't keep rubbing elbows with people who aren't successful. Make sense? And now let me give you just a concept of uh, looking at uh, my life, just a, 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 a little slim shot of a piece of my life where this was so absolutely true. See, in 1992, at a time I lived in San Antonio and I, was, I hung up my shingle to start practicing law there. You're gonna hear more of my background later. But I, when, I, when I was practicing law, there was a gentleman who owned Sterling Bakery Foods uh, a major corporation in San Antonio, and he heard about my reputation, and he called me up and he said, Mary Jo, I'd like to come over and have lunch. Now, is that a good thing or a good thing, right? I mean, you, you just moved in, you hung out your shingle, you're starting your practice. I was in my early 30s, and I get a phone call from a major corporation. So I went out to lunch, and as, as it would be, the gentleman not only hired me as his outside counsel, but he also put me on his board of directors, right? 32, 33 years old, okay, right? I mean, that was really exciting for me. Again, connections. You want to be in connections. About four months later, the same gentleman called me up, Roy Teresina, and he said, you know, Mary Jo, I've, I have a couple of friends of mine who I met at Rotary Club. Did everybody hear that? Rotary Club. How many clubs do you belong to where you have very successful people? You're surrounding yourself with other business people or entrepreneurs that are very successful or maybe in the same slot you are growing into that success, but have a series of contacts themselves, which could help you. So when he talked about these guys at Rotary Club and he said, you know what, Mary Jo, these two guys are trying to buy out, they're looking at a company to buy out, they, they're looking for additional financing. And he said, they're, they, they're trying to raise another $100,000 and they asked me if I could get four or five people together to put together a hundred grand to get that last segment of cash they need to buy out this fish food company. Well, first of all, some of you go, fish food? Why in the heck would you want to buy a fish food company? I said the same thing. I had three cats. The last thing I cared about was fish, right? <laughs> anyway, so I was like, fish food? I knew nothing about fish food. 
But I said to Roy, what's the most important thing if you're going to make an investment in a company? Can I tell you what that is? Besides publicly traded companies, of course, on the stock exchange. But if you're going to invest in a pri make a private investment in a company, you want to know who the management are. Who are these people who are going to run the company? So I made an appointment to go out to lunch with them. I spoke with them, took a great lunch. I had a lot of confidence in the two gentlemen that were going to be running the company. So I came back and I put $20,000 down to get 4% of a fish food company. My first question to you, how many of you have $20,000 somewhere right now that you could invest if an opportunity knocked at your door? So make a note to yourself, I want to be in position properly to take advantage of these kind of opportunities. So what happened to my 20,000? I made a $20,000 investment and the company went on. I kept doing my business in San Antonio. And all of a sudden, about two years later, I started getting $20,000 dividend checks every six months. That's 40,000 a year on a 20,000 investment. For those who don't have the math mind, that's a 200% rate of return on an annual basis. Is that a good thing or a good thing, right? Terrific. Just from connections, knowing the right people, being in the right place at the right time, and being able to take advantage of the connection. But that's not the end of the story. Four years later, this same company aligned themselves with a small distribution network out there. Some of you may have heard of them. They're called Walmart. Walmart took them in to distribute their fish food product. Within 12 months after that, a publicly traded company swooped in out of Ohio to buy this little fish food company in Cibolo, Texas. And my little $20,000 investment turned into $1.1 million. Connections. Are we clear? So look at who you're spending time with. Look around the people that you're rubbing elbows with. Who am I spending my precious only limited asset with? Who am I spending it with? Whom is that? Are these people that are quality people going to lead me to greater things? Or are there people that are just taking and robbing my time? So ask the question, am I increasing my prospect of success or decreasing it? Yeah, big question for all of us, right? And who the heck knew that a fish food company could produce so much? In fact, it's funny, this, the, the little fish food company here, Tetra Fin, that's the company that bought out the Cibolo Texas company. <laughs> so it all fits in. So you want to be able to be in that position, right? To be able to take advantage of what presents itself. So you just heard a little segment of my background. I hope it's okay. Let me give you a little bit more background on who this Mary Jo Hilliker is. All right. So I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, okay? Born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was fourth born of four children in three and a half years and no twins or triplets. So my parents were very active. They got married at an older age for that era. Uh, my mother, I believe, was around 29, my dad 27. So they ended up having four kids in three and a half years and I very poor. I was the fourth one to kick come out. And so what happened to me is, of course, I looked around and I found that I better compete or I'm going to get nothing in life, right? So I became very competitive. Did that reward me in many ways? Absolutely. I worked really hard. I went on to college. Uh, I did play college basketball in an era where women didn't get scholarships, but it was still a blast to play. Um, and after I got graduated from college, I decided to go to law school. So I went out to, um, I went to University of Wisconsin Madison Law School, graduated top of my class there in order called Order of the Coif. And after I did that, I had spent some time in New York City. How many of you spent some time in New York City? Anyone in the group? So you kind of know how dynamic New York City is. And it was for me too. I won the trip when I was 16 years old. And I'll never forget when I, I'd never been in a hotel. Remember back, Mary Jo grew up in a very poor family. The, I never had stayed a hotel in my life. We always camped everywhere we went. So all I knew were tents, right? That's it, tents. And of course, the latrines in the middle of the night when you had to go potty, right? <laughs> anyway, so I'm, I'm out there with a chaperone, New York City at the Plaza Hotel, and we're going to check in. All my eyes must have been bigger than my glasses. And all of a sudden, this man comes up and takes my bag and starts taking off with it. And I chased him down. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was the porter. He was just trying to take it to my room, <laughs> but I didn't know any better. <laughs> so the fun things in life when you're so naive, but back to New York. So I decided, I don't know if I want to live in Wisconsin the rest of my life. I may want to experiment and live somewhere else. And some of us have all had those ideas. Maybe it's something different somewhere else, somewhere look at. So I decided to go out to NYU, get a master's in tax. And so I, I, I went out there and I, I loved the time I spent in New York. I loved all the plays. I was getting, you know, going out to TKTS every weekend to get paper. I think back then I was spending $15 for a show on Broadway. Today I still go when I go to New York. Typically on mission trips, I still go to TKTS, but the, even at that rate, it's like $100 per ticket compared to when I went. But um, love the shows, but why didn't I stay in New York City? Because I loved people so much, and that's what made me love New York. But the problem was every time I walked down the streets in New York City, no one would make eye contact with me. I bet some of you can relate to that if you've been there, right? And I thought, you know, Mary Jo, you'd die out here. You would just be so depressed because all you want to do is love on people. And no one would talk to me. So I ended up back in, in Milwaukee. I took a job with the largest law firm in the state of Wisconsin, Foley and Lardner. And, uh, and I just had spent a couple of years there on their tax and, and corporate uh, area. And I brought in a client called Farmhouse Foods. Uh, they heard about my reputation and what I've been doing. So I started doing business with them. And within a year of doing their business for them, they called me over to their corporate headquarters. And they said, Mary Jo, we want you to join us as vice president and general counsel. People, I was 28 years old. This is a publicly traded company. Vice President General Counsel. And I don't say this to boast, I'm just saying, you know, there was no Me Too movement back then. So how many women do you think had any of those kind of corporate positions? Not very many. So it was such an honor, I couldn't say no to it. And I, I really got tired. If, if you know anything about being a lawyer and practicing law, especially in major law firms, you don't have a life. You get Sunday off, maybe, if there's not a transaction going on. So I decided I, I got to have a life. I want to have more of a life. I love to sail and I love to, you know, working out and all the things. And I, and I the, the, the routine was a little much for me at the law firm. So I decided to jump ship. And there you see a picture, actually a picture of me on the form here. Or I'm sitting around. I was in, uh, I think I was about, at this stage, I was about 29 years old working for Foley and Lardner at this time. These are lawyers. This is a whole group of lawyers. And I was in Germany for three months working with Foley and Lardner to buy ITT Rega Lunch Technik, uh, a German company. And I was head negotiator. So can you see any other women in that picture? That, that was the story of my life at Foley and Lardner. So then onward at Farmhouse Foods, Vice President and General Counsel, and working inside corporate America. I don't know how many of you had experiences in a corporate America position where maybe the ethics weren't quite what you found acceptable. How many can raise their hand to that? Have you ever been around people where you just look around and you go, wow, I don't agree with them. I don't think their ethics are right. Well, that's what happened to me at Foley and Lardner. And I kept trying to fight them over and over again as vice president general counsel. And I kept working on that, working on it. And finally, I just said to myself, you know what? And this is a great lesson for everyone. If you can't change the ethics in your environment, they will change you. So I knew that it was time for me to move on. It was time for me to move on and do something different. And that's when I moved to San Antonio. I moved down to San Antonio. I loved it down there. I bought a company, I, a, a, a turnaround company. And uh, it was uh, a, another partner of mine and us did it. We did it together. And it, it was already kind of on the verge of bankruptcy. Within six months, we had to throw it into bankruptcy. And then what happened is we ended up not being able to resolve it and work out of bankruptcy. So we finally had to shut it down. So that was kind of one of those things where it was the first time something failed in my life. How many in this room have had something fail in your life, right? We all go through failures in different times in our life, different experiences we have. But back then it was the first time that happened to me and I was in my early thirties and I looked at that and all of a sudden I felt I was a failure, right? We have a hard time disassociating facts in our life with conclusions we make about it. We draw those conclusions and we store them in our mindset. And I was a failure. And at the time I was just very thankful because my uncle Gene called me up from St. Louis and he said, 
I was in depression. I was very frustrated. I didn't, I mean, I, I just thought my life was over. And my uncle Gene called me up and he said, Mary Jo, you didn't fail. The company failed. The only way you fail in life is you fa if you fail to learn from the experiences that you have. And that was such brilliant advice for me at that time in my life because I don't know how much further I could have spiraled. And to add insult to injury, I did such a great job of liquidating out the company that the bank called me up and they had me come over and they offered me a job. They wanted me to be vice president in charge of their liquidation department. And I was like, the last thing I want to do is be a part of people's devastations in their lives. That was so depressing. It didn't matter how much money they offered, I was never going to do it. So all I did was entered, I basically ended up hanging out my shingle and, 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 in my, and started my law practice and went on from there. And all of these experiences in my life that I went through allowed me to, you know, understand a lot about what causes us to win and what causes us to lose. And, and the major aspect of all this starts and ends with one thing, controlling our minds. If we don't control our minds, again, we won't control much of anything else. So a couple of years back, I decided I want to give back in a huge way. And so I set up a brand new company called Global Mindset Mastery Association. And my company provides advanced programs for mastering your mindset in all areas of your life. Mostly, number one, wealth, well, your relationship with money, your relationship with your health, because that's critical as well. And I'm a certified nutrition coach and a functional nutritionist. So I love that area as well. It became critically important to me with working with my dad. So uh, just like you've seen in my past, I, when I jump into something, I take all on. I take it all on. Um, and also relationships, right? We want to create even greater success in our life through all of these categories. And so that's my company called Global Mindset Mastery. So my question to you right now is ask this to yourself. What if there is something out there that you don't know you don't know? Let me say it again. If there's something out there that you don't know you don't know, that's a roadblock in your life, that's stopping you from achieving the success you want in your life, will you ever solve it? Again, go back to the fact you don't know you don't know. I venture to say you'll never solve it because if you don't know what it is, how do you solve it, right? We have a hard enough time solving things, problems that we do know. So the issue comes this is like the only true wisdom is in knowing that we know nothing. So we start from what I call the beginner's mind, right? This comes from Socrates. This is, this is, I say it as well, but I'll give Socrates all the credit because that's where it started, I believe. The only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. So we come from a beginner's mind. We're ready to learn something new. And why am I so committed to teaching this and helping people bust through their mindset limitations? Because I've spent 40 plus years in the business world as an entrepreneur, and I've seen too many people that have failed and failed for the reason that they were just stuck for no good reason. They keep looking around, they go, oh, I need more marketing, I need to work harder. How many of you have said these things? I need to just find the right person, I need to just find the right concept for my business. I just need to, you fill in the blank. You're missing the most important ingredient to your success in life, which is I need to work on clearing my mindset letting go of the things I don't know I don't know that are holding me back in life. So how about taking a, a look at what some of those things might be for us, right? I'll just share with you a few of them because this course, it, you know, they're only giving me 45 minutes to talk to you. Otherwise, I could talk to you for 45 hours. Right? <laughs> I love the material so much. So let's jump in and look at some of the things. First of all, let's talk about fact meaning. This is a huge program. It's a horrific program in and of itself. You see, what happens to us in life, any kind of fact that happens in life, we take the fact and we store it in what we call our subconscious. But we don't store the fact that it happens. In our subconscious, we store the meaning that we have given it. 
So whatever that fact is in our life, whatever the event is, whatever the crisis that occurred, whatever the relationship, whatever somebody said to me when I was six years old, whatever happened to me in that playground, what happened to me in my first date in seventh grade, what all these things that have happened, you go back because you're just full of a content vault of facts that have happened in your life, but we store them as meanings. And if we give them negative meanings and get a negative connotation, guess what happens? Every time our conscious mind tries to pull something up and make a decision about something, what comes back into our conscious mind? Our subconscious meaning that we've given it. If we go back and we look at what happened to me when my company failed in 1992, I believe it was. Wow. After I'd put all that time and effort, if my uncle never would have come into my life at that stage, I made the fact that my company failed that what? I was a failure. How many of you have succumbed to that? You know, we can look at people like Edison. I mean, that guy creating the light bulb, he had thousands of failures before he finally succeeded. He never accepted failure in his life as something that was, he knew that it was just a matter of time. He knew that he just needed to rethink it one more time. It was that perseverance and that, and that concept, like, I can figure this out. For us, it's like we may have failed at something, but that doesn't make us a failure. We don't need to label ourselves, but yet we do because it's like an automatic human response system. And how is that working for you today? I bet every one of you in the room right now can think of times where you failed and you're going, wow, Mary Jo, you're right. I'm still carrying that. Yeah. It's stored in your subconscious. Fact, meaning. Fact, meaning. One of those very powerful things that cause us to stay stuck. And they cause us to stay stuck for the rest of our life. Here's another one that was so powerful me. I'll just give you another example. You have the example about my fish food company that could have ruined my life instead allowed me to become a multimillionaire. Fact, meaning. Remember when I was early on, I told you I was four years old and I looked around at and poor, poor family with three older brothers and sisters. And I said, wow. And I don't remember doing this. It's not, not something that was in my conscious, but I became this incredibly competitive person. And when people would say sometimes we go, why are you so competitive, Mary Jo? I just kept telling him, I said, that's just the way I was made. That's just the way I was born. People, you aren't born anything but a pristine, priceless, beautiful baby. There's nothing going on in your brain, in your conscious or subconscious. In fact, your subconscious doesn't even start storing things till about three years old. So we cannot blame who we are based on how we were born. But I didn't know any better. I just didn't, I didn't take any psychology courses or any mindset mastery classes. I was just out there winging it, 17 degrees, but you know, <laughs> I didn't have that training. So I just tell people I'm competitive. But how does competitive work out in your life? Competitive means that you don't have a lot of great relationships. It means if you are my best friend, Claudia, you're in the group. If you are my best friend and you and I went and played racquetball and you beat me, even though you were my best friend, guess what? I wouldn't talk to you. Probably it would take a week or two before I could talk to you because I was so bloody competitive and you beat me. Is that crazy? My first marriage, victim to my competitive nature. If you're that competitive, how do you think that works in relationships? Well, in a marriage, it goes like this. I need to be right. <laughs> how many of you are married? If you took that stance with everything, how long would your marriage work? <laughs> Not very long. <laughs> you get it? So my first marriage lasted two years. That's it. And I made, I was just absolutely determined I was not going to get married again because I didn't know what caused it to just fail. I might have come up with a hundred reasons why, but I couldn't figure it out. So I wasn't trying that one again. <laughs> Isn't that funny how we are as people? But fact meaning, these are gigantic programs that run our life. For, and there's literally hundreds of these in every single one of us. And it's the concept of discovering them, uncovering them, and then recovering from them reprogramming that mindset to set you free. Would that be powerful? Amen to that. Yeah, it was powerful me because when I discovered that that's where my competition was, that I wasn't competitive, I chose to be competitive at three or four years old. 
when I went through that discovery, it was amazing. Within a day, I could play racquetball with anybody. And if they beat me, that's great. Because you know, one thing I know about life too, there are always going to be people better than me. My goal isn't to be the best at anything. My goal is to be the best that I can be. A standard I can live up to, not a standard I cannot. So choices. Let's talk about another program. Money. How many of you have issues around money? Whoa. <laughs> Everyone. This is one of those categories that has so many programs around it. It's not even funny. How many of you see? What does the Bible say about money? Money is the root of all. No, it doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. But you know what? We remember and what's stored in our subconscious. So many money is the root of all evil. So if you've had this upbringing and this is what you've been cloned into your head, what do you think? Are you think you're going to ever be a money attractor? You think you're going to go out and live a life and money's just going to come in your way? If this is in your subconscious, you have no chance. And if you didn't notice, look at the dollar bill that's crinkled up on the screen. You can see, well, can you read where it says the root of all evil? Isn't that funny how you can crinkle the dollar bill? It actually says that. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. Love of money, a different story. But the uh, idea of us money, money is an incredible vehicle. It allows us to create unlimited amount of things in our life. I, I went, remember when I talked about my 1.1 million I made out of $20,000 back in 2003. What did Mary Jo do with that money? Well, all I, all we do is we look at our value system and what's, what do we value? That's where we put the money. I started a brand new foundation, gave 90% of the stock to the foundation. I gave 10% of it to my church. So on on almost 1.1 million of capital gain, Mary Jo paid zero taxes because I put them both into charitable organizations so they never had to pay taxes. Is that a beautiful thing? I'd rather keep the 1.1 million than give it to the US government, right? But it also allowed me to fulfill what I wanted to do in life, which was to have my own charity. So that was a great event, which is still going on today. But idea is, yes, I look at money as a, it's a, it's a tool that you can use for good or you can use it for evil, but money in and of itself is not evil. And we have many programs around money, money. It's not just coming from the biblical sense. We have other ones. How many of you grew up in a family where your parents said money doesn't grow on trees? Okay. My parents told me that all the time. Mary Jo, money doesn't grow on trees. Why did your parents tell you that? That was a depression concept. And the reason they told you that is because of this. They wanted you to really get it, that you would have to go out there, get a great job, work hard, make a living. They didn't want you to think it was easy. They wanted you to know that working hard had value to it, that you were going to be able to attract money if you worked really hard at something. So what's the problem with that, Mary Jo, you ask? Well... When you say money doesn't grow on trees, the intriguing thing about your subconscious is it says, whoa, that means money is scarce. You follow me? And if you live your life on this planet thinking money is scarce, you won't have much money. It's a real huge problem for us. We have this scarcity mentality about money that just holds us back. There's not a lot out of it. It's hard to find. I have to work hard to get it. You get all these, these are all programs. They're subconscious belief systems that we have that we, a lot of us don't even realize that we have them. We wonder why we're not attracting money in our life and all of these are in our subconscious state. We have to break through those things in order to attract money in our lives. Because if this is your attitude, it's gonna be darn hard for you ever to attract money. And I really wanna attract money as it. And just because this issue is so huge, I'm giving everybody another gift. So if you're still on with me, here's another. And text money20 to that number and you'll get another gift. I did a huge podcast on this and, and a, a blog that you'll get access to a lot of the issues that we carry around money that will really serve you. So write this down. Everybody got this before I move on to the next live. Another free gift for all of you. I also put it in the chat. Uh, Lydia also put it in the chat so you can pick it up there as well. 
that's my assistant. So, so all these programs that we have running our lives, here's another one that your parents might have told you when you were growing up as a kid, curiosity killed the cat. Did you hear that as a kid? I suggest if you're a parent, you know exactly what it's all about because you did it with your children as well. And it usually comes about three or four years old when that child starts speaking a lot and you really want to slow down their mouth. <laughs> they ask you a 95 questions a minute. Do you remember those experiences? Yeah. And so we go, curiosity killed the cat. Well, telling a child that tells them what? It tells the child not to be curious because they don't want to kill a cat. It's stored inside of their subconscious. So now all of a sudden you've shut down them from being curious. You look at the curious people in the world that believe something could be better. They're multi-billionaires today because they didn't let anything stop them. They were curious to find solutions. Yet here we were telling our children, curiosity kills the cat. Wow. You follow. And I'm not here today to have you get depressed over what you may have done in your past. For those of you who haven't had children yet, now you can correct that and not take on the same alignment that your parents taught you because you know better. All of these are fixable. They're changeable because it's all about reprogramming our mindset. It's, it's uncovering and discovering those limiting beliefs inside of our subconscious that are just holding us down, holding us back from the success we all deserve to have in life. But if you don't know, you don't know. How will you ever break through? And that was true about me. I was having a lot of success in my life, but boy, I was having a lot of crazy stuff happen too. I couldn't have that the marriage failure, the you know, businesses. I kept going from one to another and I kept out there going, what's happening to me? And I, and I just thought I was competitive. I had to win at everything. So that prevented me from a lot of friendships that I could have had because people don't really typically like to be around people that are unbelievably competitive, right? It's a hard relationship to grow. So I had superficial relationships in many instances. And, you know, it was just not, life wasn't like it should be. I knew there was something more. And it was when I went through my discovery process in my late 30s that I broke loose of all of these limiting beliefs, all these things that were keeping me from being the best I could be. So truthfully, if you don't want to be the best you could be, then this presentation is not for you. But if you want to improve that, we can keep blaming everybody around us and all the things happening to us for all the problems that we have, or we can sit back and go, you know what? I need to work on me because there's something similar. Every single problem that I've ever had, there's one main cog in that machine in each one of those problems. And it is what? Me, my divorce, me, my inability to play racquetball with my best friends, me, my inability to, you know, grow great relationships. That's me being a detractor of money. That was me early on. You follow? I was the main factor, just like you are the main factor in everything that's happened to you in your life. So we want to create something different. What do we need to do? Go out there and do something different, but know that you're not the only ones being programmed. You can even look at animals are programmed because we go, Oh, where are you? Is this just a typical for human beings? No, elephants, all sorts. And there's a great story about elephants. You know, if you ever go to a, a, a a circus, you're going to see the, the baby elephants when they're first babies, they tie them and they put a stake in the ground. They tie a rope around their leg. And you know what? Every time they pull on it, get to get resistance. So they learn that the minute that resistance occurs, that's as far as they can go. Do you know what they do at a circus? Look at the 20,000 pound elephants. They put a little stake in the ground with a little rope attached. And that's as far as they can go. You talk about programming. That's pretty significant. That's like, think about you. You're got, you've got a stake in the ground around your leg. You think that's all you can go because that's all you know. That's as far as you've ever gotten. No one's ever highlighted to you that all you do is bend that knee and pull it out. And guess what? You're free to create whatever you want in life. But that's what our programs do for us, right? 
So here's something you can experience yourself. I'll give you a few minutes to do this. Just to, uh, you know, if everyone in the room, just take out a sheet of paper and draw these nine dots. If you've done this exercise before, then fine. You can just have fun. You can participate with us. But uh, anyway, it's because we're on Zoom, I don't have to stop you from like ruining it for everybody else like I would in a room. But there's these nine dots. Now here's your, here's your objective. I'm going to give you an objective. This is a little game to play. Okay, are you all ready? Here's your game. There are nine dots here. I want you to do this, get out, you put those nine dots just like this, equal distance apart, nine of them like this. And I want you to put your pen on the paper. You can choose wherever you wanna do that after I give you the final instructions. And your goal is to do this. You need to connect. Once you put your pen in the, the head of the pen on the paper, you can't pull it off. So you have to draw these contiguously. So it goes, put the pen on the paper, draw four lines, straight lines, no wavy, Draw four straight lines without lifting your pen off and connect all nine dots. Four straight lines without taking your pen off the paper and connect all nine dots. Okay, you're ready? Set, go. Pen on the paper. And if you have a question, I think you can actually come off mute and ask the question if you have one. Pen on the paper, four straight lines without taking the pen off the paper. So they're all connected. You can make a right turn, a left turn, whatever turn you wanna make, but they have to be straight lines, four lines, connecting all nine dots. Do, 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 do. How's everybody doing? Usually this causes some frustration. You ready for the answer? Here's an answer for you. Look at how the lines are drawn. Start with the dot, go out, and the first thing I get when I show people the answer, they go, Mary Jo, you went outside the box. Notice how when we looked at nine dots, the first thing that our head did was say it's a box. And so all of a sudden we felt restricted that we couldn't extend our lines outside the box. Why is this an incredibly intriguing exercise to do? Because it shows to each and every one of us that we have limitations that are self-imposed self-imposed limitations on how we think about things. So when I do this in a classroom with 30 people, maybe one person gets it, maybe, on a good day. Most people never see it because the nine dots look like a box and we had self-imposed on us that was a limitation that the line couldn't go out the box. I won't go any further with you. The whole exercise here is only for one reason to understand that we live in boxes. We've constructed these boxes around our lives. But I can actually sit down with you. I can show you how I can connect every one of those dots with four lines. I just showed you. I can connect them with three lines. I can connect them with two lines. I can connect all nine dots with one line. It's called releasing the constraints in my mind and allowing my creativity to flow. Follow me? And how does this apply in our life? Oh, so many ways. So let's, let's lead this to a conclusion. You are today where your thoughts have brought you. You will be tomorrow where your thoughts take you, James Allen. It's our thinking that controls our results in life. In order to free ourselves up to create the unbelievable success, which I believe in every single one of your paths, we need to straighten out that thinking. It's our short thinking, it's our mix-ups, it's our programming that we've had in our lives, most of which we do not know, we do not know, that are holding us back, right? You follow me? So how do we correct that? Well, I have a program called, the. it's a first level program called Kryptonite Breakthrough. Everybody understand Kryptonite, right? We know what Kryptonite is. Everybody knows Superman. What held back Superman? The Kryptonite. So it's totally applicable to you. We each have our kryptonite, some more than others, but everybody has it. 
And I, so I established an eight week program called the Kryptonite Breakthrough Program. In that program, I talk about the mind and consciousness. I'm gonna teach you how your mind works. That's kind of the first step out of the box. You have a conscious, a subconscious, and a super conscious. It's good to understand how our mind works because it's hard to reprogram a mind if you don't understand how it works. So we spend a session on that, just really getting, how does that get programmed? What's really controlling all my decisions in my life? Is it your conscious mind or your subconscious? It's your subconscious. So to change my results in life, I need to work on my subconscious. And there are many ways to do that out there. I have a special one I work with, which you'll be able to learn about. Uh, that is a, a, a very effective way, but it, you know, it's, there are other ways you can do it as well. But you want to reprogram that subconscious. But you have to do the discovery work first. I don't know what to reprogram if I don't know what's going wrong for me, right? So that's important as well. Mind and consciousness, all right? And then I love to teach wealth mindset. Because it is about your relationship with money. It's about your relationship with success. Some people have a, I mean, they've put success to mean something inside of their subconscious. They can't even tell you what it is. If you ask them, what does success mean to you? And they go, well, and they start going into <laughs> into this, like, they want to balance, well, I don't want to give up my family. Notice right away, I don't want to give up my family. What do they have going on? It's a program that says you cannot have a great family life and have success at the same time. Is that a lie or a lie? I didn't give you much of an option, did I? <laughs> because it's a big fat lie. I know some unbelievably wealthy people that have incredible family lives. That's also a choice you make. So uncover your negative programming around money. Discover new empowering beliefs to replace the old ones. So you become a money attractor instead of a detractor. So when you have, you're going to accumulate 20000 in a bank, you don't mind investing it in a fish food company because you know what? If it doesn't work out, you'll recreate it. Most of us are so fearful, we just store it in the safest bank account we can find, which makes 4% interest. I, don't, I like making 20, 30% of my money every year, not 4%, right? Recover from it. Step into the power within you to impact our world and, and this world by choice and commitment. Living your life by choice. Write that down, everybody, on your piece of paper. I want to live life by choice. In other words, what if you could just choose your life? What would that look like for you? Where would you live? What kind of job would you have or no job at all? What would you own? Who would you be interacting with? What charities would you start? You know, every husband. If I live by choice, that's what my life looks like. How about relationships, right? You want to become a masterful listener. Less than 1% of our society knows how to listen. Less than 1%. That means out of all the people in this room, probably no one knows really how to listen. Because how do you get trained how to listen? Your parents. If they were bad listeners, you are too. Unless you become a counselor and go to college and go to listening courses for your counseling degree, right? Victim responsible. Yeah. You can go victim to it or you can stand in responsible. It's a huge Huge concept, people. And responsible doesn't mean that you're liable for something. It means you're able to respond. Don't go victim to anything. I love it. I go like this. Oh, there you go, victim again. There's victim languaging in your life. It's in your vocabulary. You've got to release that as well. That's part of getting rid of being victim to anything. Standing, think about if I could live my life out of victim status and then able to respond, what do you think that would change in your life? I'll start with one word, everything. Why do I love doing this? Well, because I have a phenomenal family. I have a phenomenal life. What you're seeing on the screen are my grandkids, my, my great nephew up there who's as darling as a bed bug, uh, a couple of my ministries. I go to Brazil every year, and that's what I'm standing up here in the top uh, top one in the, in the left side. That's me with a Braz couple of Brazilians. I, I do graffiti ministries uh, every year in New York City too as well. And I love that. And there's my husband with uh, our uh, seven grandchildren. So I have a lot of reasons that I do what I do because I love to contribute. I love to make a difference in this world in as many ways as possible as long as I'm in this world. 
And that's, I believe the world's waiting for your voice as well. And every one of us is different. You have something that you want to create in this world. And some of you don't even know what it is anymore because you've given up hope with it. But I'm challenging you to grab that back. There's always hope. So the revolts for people that we create in the class attract wealth to you. How would you like to be a wealth attractor? So money comes to you. Greater clarity on your core values. Most people don't even understand what their core values are. Their number one value in life. What is it? They give me gobbledygook. I go, oh my gosh, no wonder. When I learned what my number one core value was, I could from that day forward live the happiest life of my dreams by just getting into my core value. It brought me more joy than it, and I had no idea until I was in my late 30s what that core value was, right? Build better relationships. Is that important? I'd say so for all of us. A new set of eyes. You'll see yourself anew. Here's some of the things that we don't have a lot of time left, but you know, um, every one of my courses, I give, I give people 100% money back guarantee because it's not about the money to me. It's about making a difference. So if you take my class and you feel like it didn't make a difference for you, guess what? I'll write you a check. One phone call, a check's in the mail. This is Beth. This is Dr. She is a, a child psychologist that happened on my course. Now, what I had to call her the second week of my course and say, why are you taking this course? Because why would a child psychologist take this course? This course knocked her socks off. She loved it. so. She'd never been exposed to what I gave her in the class. Isn't that amazing? She's a precious woman, and she loved every minute of it. Look at her in class. I have other people, they get stuck. This, this woman was so stuck. She had such a horrific background. And I mean, she was still living in her past. And she felt, look at this. I'm an eight-week partnership. She felt there's a partnership because Mary Jo was all in to support her. I love that word because that's what I love doing is making a difference in people's lives. Yeah. Cynthia, I only wish the course never would have come to an end. She still sees me from time to time. Mary Jo, what can I do next? <laughs> it's hard to believe how unknowing. This woman's in her 70s unknowing I've been. Now I feel rocks have been removed from my path. So what's my course? Eight-week mindset mastery program, 997. Here's the different elements of the class. We don't have much time left, but we talk about how the human mind facts, meanings. A lot of these are things we just touched upon today, but each week we have assignments. We have a one-hour webinar you watch and homework assignments and then group coaching call. The other advantage to my class is this. I know everybody goes through development at a different pace and you might have an aha moment in the midweek. I give you full access to Mary Jo for all eight weeks. In other words, if something comes up and you go, man, I don't know what to do with this, call Mary Jo. I'm here to do one thing and that's to impact your life so that you can live at a higher level. You can achieve more success. Whatever you define that is for you, that's your definition. I just want you to be that person that you know is inside of you. So we look at living life by choice, getting out of victim status, no matter what that is that's holding you back, being victim. Be with listening, how to be in that 1%, great listeners in the world. Uncovering the rudder in your life, that's your number one core value. You'll get to re uncover your top 10 core values in this class. And then looking at each day as a first day, last day, empowerment to start acting, right? I also have a silver program, monthly newsletter, empowerment calls that you can participate in on an annual basis. I have Mindset Mastery digital series for $2.97. Those are digital tapes you can listen to. But for today, we do a huge bonus because we always get wrapped into these presentations. We, Mary Jo, what break are you going to give today? <laughs> so you can have all of this, the Mindset Mastery eight-week course, which is usually $9.97. If you went to my website right now, that's what it would cost you. Plus you'll get the digital set, two months of silver program, all for $4.97, saving you over $1,000. And this price is good only through Sunday, July 19th. We'll take this link off that you see up there will be gone on Sunday, July 19th at the end of the day. So if you'd like to participate, we'd love to have you on the course. I love impacting lives. That's my goal in life is go out and make a difference in people's lives. And the more people I can touch, the more joy it brings me in my life. So if you'd like to be a part of that process, I'd love to have you on board. And I leave you with this quote because Marion Williamson, I had no idea she was going to run for president, but I've been using this quote for years because it's so precious and so indicative of exactly what people go through. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate 
our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure, each one of you. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. I believe that's true for the majority of people on this planet. We're frightened from what we have inside of us that we know is there that could shine a huge light in this world and make a big difference. So I want to get rid of that fear and make it become a reality for you, that you truly become that light. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being on board. Hope to see you in one of my classes. I enjoyed it. I hope you did, too. I hope I contributed to your life today. Thank you so much.